when I was in Hawaii a couple of weeks back? Yeah. So last time we chatted was in when you were in Hawaii, and the time before that was when I was in Philly, and yeah. And the one time before that was when you were still at Hyundai, and I was hating my life back in Flint. <laughs> okay. So we chatted about three times now. Yeah. And linked up. We got to make this official, man, and you got to come out to California or we got to pay a trip to summer. Dude, for sure. San Francisco, that's where you're at, right? Yeah, I'm based over here in Pacifica. I don't know if you know where Half Moon Bay is or it's probably like 20 minutes south of San Francisco. I see. I've been to like so, Sunnyvale. Um, you know where Sunnyvale is? Yeah, I know. That, that's the South Bay towards San Jose area. I see. <clears throat> yeah, that's one of the suburbs I know. But – yeah, dude. So you have a really cool like history in tech. So you started off at Kettering as a mechanical engineer, and then, yep. What year did you graduate again? Two thousand and fifteen. Two thousand fifteen. And then yeah. your so, thesis, your thesis was in graphene. That's that's yeah, really cool. a little bit different. And um, so my three best friends, uh, Riley and Fee, whom I live with. We all had it in our minds that eventually one day we'll team up and come together under a new business, under right. a business. We, we just had this mindset right from the get-go that we, that's what we wanted to do was ultimately work on our own passions for ourselves, inspiring and helping the world do whatever the fuck we're trying to do. Right. Um, <clears throat> so when, when I was in our, um, when it came time to selecting a specialty or a concentration, a minor, whatever, I chose my concentration as alternative energy because I was working at Tesla at the moment. So I was, I was very interested in alternative energy. Right. And, um, and at the time I was working in the vehicle test group. So I knew firsthand the limitations that the battery technology that's on the Model S brings to the cost of the car, the durability of the car, and almost just the, um, <clears throat> the reproducibility of the vehicle on the mass market scale. Because realistically, nobody wants to sit and wait for an hour for a charge, man. Right. It's just not the future of it's going to be. And in order for EVs to sell and be commoditized as good as uh, petroleum cars, then they need to have quick charge times or battery pack swaps like Elon was discussing before. But, right. um, but that sort of uh, problem enticed me to uh, research into graphing. And um, ironically, I was taking a... So in um, the mechanical degree, you, can, you have a choice of a class. It is either, you could either take material science and nanotechnology right. or, or just material science. Got so it. The, the, the nanotechnology is the physics one and material science um, is, is the mechanical based one. Right. So I went physics route, um, which... I got into a class with Uma Ramabhadran, and I was interested in... <laughs> I remember that name. <laughs> Do you know Uma? I've never had yeah. her as a teacher, but yeah. Uh, she, she's good people, really good okay. people. And yeah, yeah. I told her I wanted to do it, and she followed up with me. She was like, hey, Ryan, if you really want to do this, we can make this a thing. I'll write this proposal. We can get funding to at least start it, yeah, yeah. et cetera. So I was like, yeah, sure, why not? I got it approved for my thesis, and ultimately I was able to work on that as my thesis project because wasn't I didn't have a thesis for Kettering right. except that. I didn't search for one at my job because I was bouncing around different places, so I didn't have a stable thesis location. Yeah, yeah. And the, over at the thesis office, the ones that they offered – were had were completely irrelevant to my degree. It was like starting a a hydroponic fish pond in Flint, Michigan. <laughs> I, I was like, "Are you fucking kidding me?" I mean, I'm interested in hydroponics, but like, <laughs> it, it, was, it was irrelevant. Dude, so I, I was like, "No, fuck that shit o'clock." You know, we I I so I researched and um. <laughs> Came up with that re that thesis and uh, 
Uma took me under her wing and really helped me out for that. Dude, same. I, I did a similar thing. I was given some, like, at work, we were getting a lot of data analytics stuff, and I, I wasn't inter interested in it as much. Then I went and talked to the thesis office, and they, like, gave me some ideas, but none of them really clicked. And then I came up with my own project, and then I talked to a professor, convinced the professor to work with me, and that yeah. was literally, like, that thesis, I learned so much because I was passionate about yeah. learning. Um, so that's really important, but... Talking about like graphene, um, it's really interesting with graphene, like how it started and where it's at right now. Um, right. Like in the beginning, it was highly studied by the physicists and it seemed like the physics people were the only people studying it and not a lot of engineering was happening in it and a lot of chemists were just, yeah, we get it. It's just a bunch of benzenes put together. But I think even now we haven't really tapped into the full potential of that material. No, and it's mostly because of its reproducibility on the high scale manufacturing process. Right. So like there's all sorts of different methods, as you can imagine, everything ranging from how they founded it in the first place by taking pencil, pencil graphite and sticky tape and going back and forth and a tape on tape and ripping it apart. Yes, right. etc. Um, so that was originally how it was like introduced to the world. And then Furthermore, you could go into, um, so you, most of the methods nowadays, they're either through like laser ablation, which is like a super in-depth process with high pressure chambers, expensive lasers, etc. cetera. Right. Um, you could, what I did was I furnace denialed. It's pretty much just a fancy name for sticking it in a furnace and running inert gas over it so you don't have any binding to the carbon molecules. Right. That's so super, ultimately uh, – That process is super well, cool. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's super intricate too because there's so much chemistry behind it all. So not only are you dealing with the constraints of physics and monetary value, but – like any contamination within your samples, even if it's oxygen or nitrogen gas that gets binded to the carbon structure, that right. all shows up on the ESEM, the electro scanning microscope. Right. So, um, but yeah, there's like a, there's a ton of ways to, I mean, they, they were even making graphene in a blender when I was <laughs> making it, like we're doing all sorts of concoctions and separating. Yeah. Graphene, um, but you could so you could purchase graphene out on the market and right. over at um but graphene there's there's no wholesale or that I have found yet wholesale graphene on the market you have to purchase graphene oxide graphene oxide is o which the oxygen is that binding material that makes it become almost a dielectric and so you need to uh, molecularly break that bond. And that's how I went about the process using breaking that bond using furnace annealing or something called atmospheric plasma annealing, which is just taking a plasma gun on a, right. like a CT rotary head and scanning 14 scans, you know, going through different sample sizes, scan, scan numbers, et cetera. Um, right. And that the, was yeah, like it was a, it was a, it was a feasible method to produce it for sure. Um, I did have one problem though. Right. So like those methods were used to produce graphene? Like you guys yeah. were so you, to take graphene oxide, which is off the shelf, you can buy it from Sigma Alderich and all the top line like right, right. Um, company. Purchase that, but you need to reduce that to pure graphene bonds, which are your uh, like C to C or yeah, like they, they have a, a double bond in between them. And to, you need yeah. to Figure out how do you remove the oxygen, which we've done this by using the through plasma annealing, or when it's through furnace annealing, we had to pass a compound of, um, I think it was like 90, hold on, I think it was like 98% argon gas and like 2% nitrogen gas to, right. to take out the oxygen bond while we annealed it. Yeah. But the problem is, is you can anneal it, you can remove all of the oxygen that you want from it, but how do you bind it into a material that can be used as a capacitor? Uh, as we know, capacitors 
are pretty much two electrically static plate plates that if they have to a charge big enough they could act as a battery but it's pretty much just two electrically static plates right and when we're, we're dealing with graphene or like this thin material it needs to one we need to have a an electrically conductive substrate to bind it onto and and that electrically conductive substrate needs to be very porous because surface area in the game of charging is king so what we end up using was we use something called nickel foam so nickel foam it was this really really fine mesh foam that you could take a quarter size hole punch and just pop out these little nickel foam samples if will I would then take those nickel foam samples and soak them in uh, reduced graphene oxide, the RGO from Sigma Aldrich, and let them soak underneath the controlled amount. And then after I took them out, I would then do my plasma annealing and then furnace annealing and then get my samples. That's super that. cool. And was this the work you were doing at your thesis or was this done at Tesla? No, this is thesis work. Yeah, this is all just complete, um, just interested schoolwork yeah, yeah. that Uma embarked on. Um, but afterwards, like she was, she was so she was so into it, man, that she <laughs> wrote a proposal to Washington D.C. And then one day, she wrote me an email. She's like, "Hey, Ryan, I signed you up to talk in Washington D.C. I hope that you're okay with it. Are you right. okay with it?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I guess." She was like, "Okay, great." Well, you're going to come back here as soon as and finish your thesis. And then that June that you're graduating, you're flying to Washington, D.C. and presenting this thesis in front of like a hundred physicists all yeah. in the room or whoever wants to hear, is to hear your panel. So yeah. that's what I did. You know, like I, I practiced the shit out of the presentation. I was up there 15 minutes of fame. Super Dude, nervous. You practiced so good that you still remember most of it. <laughs> I do, I do, man. I do, and actually, that's how I actually this project was how I landed my job at Hyundai Ventures. Ah. So my, yes, yeah, so my boss, um, he reached out to me. My boss at Hyundai Ventures reached out to me and said, "Hey, Ryan, I need to fill a prototype R and D position at our firm. Right. Are you interested?" Yes, of course, John. I'm very interested. I was so interested that I forgot the fucking interview. <laughs> I forgot the whole interview and you know I to be fair like I was in the middle of packing getting ready to go back to the west coast right after a school term middle of staying about a family a super busy day yeah yeah and I get a phone call from Yana his secretary assistant hey Brian are you still on schedule to have a meeting I was like fuck god damn it yes <laughs> J yes Yana tell John I'm so sorry I'm I'm right now called them and I must have interviewed really well with them and at the end of at the end of it I told him because he asked me he was like so Ryan like now that I tell you a little bit about Hyundai Ventures I know it's still a little bit of a, a still a little esoteric for you but um why do you want to do this position what makes you interested in doing it and um because how he explained this position to me was that it was going to be a um a little bit of technology assessment, a little bit of research and development, my own projects, then a little bit of just uh, voicing your engineering opinion during deal flows. Right. Cool. So, and I told him that, like, I, I sense I wanted to be Tony Stark. I, I, I told him Iron Man was my inspiration. I wanted to learn everything underneath the sun. Uh -huh. um, it, it sold to him. It sold to him, especially he's a big Marvel fan. So, ironically, it just. Oh yeah. That usually ends up working fine. <laughs> yeah, but anyways, um, he ended up having me doing a tech assessment prior and writing a little presentation prior to me coming on board. So he gave me this wearable technology, which was a it was a company called Athos. You, you might know them. It's a it's a fitness sensing application yes. that senses respiration rate, tracks a whole bunch of shit. So. He gave me this clothing, the sensor. He was like, all right, I want you to go test this and write me a little report on the do's and don'ts and why's and because's. And yeah, so yeah. I came back to it. But the presentation that I wrote, it wasn't 
I used um, what's it? I used Prezi because I because Prezi it's a nice interactive like it keeps your mind focus on because it's jumping it's in yeah for audience it's super user friendly um and yeah. yeah like for people that are seeing a Prezi versus the PowerPoint it's way cleaner like it's cleaner it just feels yeah. like it goes with the flow so yeah. I did that but he came back and he's like yeah so this isn't exactly what I was looking for but you wrote a thesis and and made a presentation didn't you I was like yeah I did and I told him a little bit about well and we talked a little bit more about it and, I, and then he was like okay yeah just read me back the thesis and then and then we'll go from there. so did I remember I was like, shit, like three months went by and I'm like now scrambling, looking through all my footnotes to my thesis again and the presentation maybe 10 minutes before this interview. Yeah. And I remember just reading off the footnotes and just, you know, more information came back to me. And then next thing you know, and he was like, all right, cool. Well, you're, you can start on October 15th. See you How about, uh, so like when you look at Tesla and you look at Hyundai, Hyundai feels super established and old. Uh, very like uh, not well managed, but like just an old school company. Whereas Tesla sounds like a startup, a new company. Like when people look at Tesla, it's like the Elon Musk vibe. It's the entrepreneurialism, and it, it's just cool. Like it's cool to have a Tesla here, even in like this little town where I am right now, Peoria, Illinois. Like I sometimes I see a Tesla and I'm like, holy shit, this is cool. When I see a yeah. hot, it's like another day. So how was it like going between one company to another? What was the big difference? Um, so, well, I'll tell you the, uh, the big difference. Well, there was actually many uh, similarities, many differences, of course. Right. Um, the biggest difference would have to be how bureaucratic these larger organizations are. So the whole reason that the Silicon Valley is the way they are, the reason that this culture is Silicon Valley culture and the why venture capitalism is more so prominent in this local general region. I mean, right. there's a ton of attributing factors such as like Ivy League schools what within the same distance. Um, you have obviously all of these national labs working on and it just so happened that IBM and then Apple started here in that whole realm. But now, um, but now this culture over here is a, uh, it's a big mixing pot of not only just different ethnicities in different cultures, but also just people come, are trying to come over here because their dreams can be grown with a little bit of effort and, uh, and luck. Um, so I think, so Tesla, Tesla made it to the, where they are today, um, mostly attributing to the fact of they have the Numi man. The, the Numi plant, the Toyota Numi plant, they right. purchased that in the downturn of the economy in 2008. I think, I don't know the exact amount, but it was under, it was like, it was like $300 million. But that factory is fully retrofitted out, ready to pump out thousands of cars a day. Right. That Toyota using. And so, oh shit. That's, 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 <laughs> so, so they, they fucking swept the market. And right when I started Tesla, in right. 2012, I started in uh, RC, RC1. Okay. So re release date version one, then it goes release version two, and then start a production. So I, so I came on board for that two, uh, two versions prior to SOP. And right. um, the biggest, but like, I remember just how fast and nimble they moved that if there was a problem, in design, for instance, lift gates were clashing on the Model S as it was rolling off the line. Now you're adding extra time, extra repair damage, extra fucking everything. Right. And clashing is no good for anybody. So they came up to me, director of manufacturing. Hey, Ryan, this is going down on, on the car, on the Model S lift gate. I need you to fix the radius and report back to me ASAP. Hey, this is all fixed up. Okay, cool. Let's let, let, to go, let's sign this off. He made his sign off, and then the next week they kicked off tooling, and then new inner panels were being stamped that in the very next week. If it were Hyundai, that takes months, and it takes 
a ton of loops and hoops. You need 50, 100 people to sign off one given fucking thing. It's a nightmare. Oh, um, man. So the bureaucracy is the biggest, is the biggest difference. Um, and also Hyundai, I was in a smaller organization. It was a startup feel, if you will, in a right. company because like eight people big. But we were attached to a multi-million billion dollar conglomeration. And especially them being Korean, you have a lot of dictator and old style business models that come with it. Oh, so, wow. so there was there was that aspect. There was the aspect of how big it was and you need all the bureaucratic hoops and loops. And there was also the huge there's another aspect to it because we were we were we are Hyundai Ventures is an American company, but it is taken care of by Hyundai's R and D budget, which comes from Korea, not Korea. Really Korea. And but our organization was owned by Hatchy, which is Hyundai America, Technical Incorporated. Right. So like there was so much fucking just nonsense that we that I just had to face going back and forth, just for everything ranging from getting budgets to right. um, getting press release and all, all sorts of stuff. Man. That's really interesting. So I guess like the speed that these companies executed, that was very different, both of them. So yeah. Tesla being really fast at it, apparently, I guess. Yep. But when you have that sort of speed, Keep in mind, um, you have a lot of, when you have that sort of speed in your company, you have a lot of problems because your company starts to become very cutthroat. And, you know, and everybody who I've actually interviewed just recently, and when and people ask me, would, you, would I go back to Tesla? I told them, no fucking way would I wow. go back to Tesla. It's a cool product, but man, it's a very, like, unless... Yeah, yeah, like I'll paint a picture of how the environment is. I'm not saying like I'm, this was just my take on my internship experience in in Tesla. That yeah. you are a cog in a machine, and that after your cog starts to get burned out because they, they push you very hard, you work in like 50, 60 hours a week. Okay, I, I get it. You work. You have to work hard and shit, especially being a fast paced company like that. But as soon as you say make a small little mistake that's meant for learning to growth for the team and yourself, you're you're cut. Or say you show any signs of weakness or failure points from getting burned out, you get cut. It's just not a very safe environment. Everyone is just kind of always looking over their shoulders, seeing like who's watching and and <laughs> the whole, their job security, man. What do you what do you mean by getting cut? Like just getting cut like just x out of the company because like it, you, there's no union workers around here so they could they all they need to say is like we don't need you anymore goodbye Shit. They, they don't need to provide you like almost any reason man. Yes. so you know for that instance like i and I, I um i searched for my full-time position my first full-time after <laughs> After I left the vehicle test group, uh, which so I was doing design work, I was doing just kind of like hands-on re vehicle retrofits with testing work, etc. But honestly, afterwards I did apply for it. But see, a lot of times in these big conglomerations, bro, you're a button clicker. That's all that you'll ever be. And as soon as you get done being a button clicker and you get bored of it, next, because there's another person who wants to be at your job because it's cool. And it's yes. cool to be in culture, a uh, startup culture, Tesla, work around cars. It's yeah. it's a, it's a cool, it's, it's a trending topic. But but the fact is, you want to know how many people like it, say in my design team. Of course, your position has all all your position and team have everything to do with it. But how many people I came in every single day, bright and chipper, rolling their eyes. Another day, another dollar. They're doing okay. This is the fifth fucking door handle. The fifth door handle redesign that they worked nothing on but the door handle and then you're at your computer days on that it just really all depends on your type of person you know but i don't think um my entrepreneurship man you know it, like i want to get to a point for myself i want to split 
I want to split my, I've gotten to a point now to where I've realized I need to split my income from income and work. Like I, I, I want my work and income to be two totally different paths. Right. You know, when I first began this journey at Kettering, I was seeking out for my dream job. Dream jobs probably do exist. But what I was coming to find was that the more I pursued my dream job, the more mundane and task like my dream job started to turn into a real job. And a real job started turning into a routine job, which ultimately started to bore me. And for me not to give a shit about it anymore. Because doing the same thing day in and day out, I'm just making somebody else a dollar figure. And it's one thing if you're pursuing a greater mission than yourself, whether it's to fucking feed the whole entire world or give everyone in Africa who needs housing houses. That's a, that's one thing. But when you're working for another company like cars, for instance, cars are the most inefficient pieces of machinery going from carbon emission to making it to gets tossed out to recycling it man it's the biggest fucking destruction that this planet has right and when you're working for companies like that and you and you see the destruction out in the world and you know you're like yeah even though they're electric cars even though electric cars they're they're still a fucking they still need, they'll still get thrown out at some point. They still will collect into a pile at some point unless you can solve those sort of problems. I feel like if we're, we're going to continue on down the line as consumers, we need to fix uh, the, all, every single recycling problem there is out for one and just fixing the real problems ultimately. Yeah, I know. That's really interesting what you were talking about, like, your income versus your job. <laughs> like I think about that too. And it's like your job will always like put a limit to how much you can earn. And yep. that limit is not determined by how good you are. It's determined by factors like how much can the company afford? How much do they want to pay you? And yep. so many other factors. And I think that's where a lot of people, when they like put a price on their skills, that's where a lot of people go wrong because you're like, you know, like the job that I have previously during my co-op, I was making like 10, 12 dollars an hour, you know, typical catering co-op job, which is, you learn a lot. But then I like, when I started full time, the job had a lot, a lot more responsibility, but it was in the same industry and you know, the, the income goes up, but then it caps. You're never going to like make more unless you change jobs or like you make all these things or yep. Or you can be a freaking, you know, a kid on the internet, make videos, a really good video once a week. Yep. And make more than the fucking 40 hour work week. Yep. In, in, in one day. <laughs> and it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's great that you brought that up, man. It, um, that's why. So as you know, I made fidget spinners, right? Right. And it, fidget spitter, boom. I just happened to have tools of trade being a laser cutter. So I made custom fidget spinners. Yeah, what the hell? Let, let, let's see where it could go. I'm only laser cutting wood, dabbling in different bearings, whatever. And next thing you know, in the height of it, it made me, I was pushing like three to $4,000 a week. Right. And for over a month straight. And, and here I am making a measly $962, busting my fucking ass. <laughs> hours a week, dude. A week, dude when, I, when I would literally wake up, Mo, the next morning and look at my phone and already see $1,500 in my bank account without even moving from my bed, that fucking excited me. I That was something, that feeling, I was like... Of course, of course, I still needed to put in the effort to make the product because unfortunately right. make the product. But what that told me and showed me was how, how e-commerce and the internet has really uh, made it available for anybody to commoditize their work and yeah. to be able to become financially free. 
Yeah. And of course, it, it, it takes work. It's not a Ponzi Dude, scheme. It's not 100%, 100%, 100%. Like the crazy thing is, they call that passive income, like, you know, the money you can make while sleeping. And a yeah. lot of people think passive income is just the money you make while you sleep. No, no, no. Like it, the t- difference is you have to put in a lot of fucking hours, like to really get that going because if it was easy, everybody would do it. And yeah, it's just so like, I think that's one mi- misconception people have about passive income. They think you can start making that like this weekend. Yeah, you probably could yeah. but, like a sustainable passive income is going to take some time to get going. Um, and then here's once you have it, you're good. Here's what I'd like about, here's what I like about that. I always see, so every day when you go to work, your work, unless you physically, <clears throat> so there's no, um, okay, hold on. Let me, how can I metaphor this? So you, you go to work for the week and everything that you do, you write down on a piece of paper, blah, blah, blah. You get shit done and you pour it in but there's no attribution to direct success and everything that you do is mostly forgotten about. Like all of your efforts and gone through at the end of the year, say you poured a fucking year into that work. Most of those efforts day in and day out are forgotten about. And you only, you have one result, which is you made the company X amount by having this product, blah, blah, blah. But the thing with this e-commerce platform, et cetera, like Shopify and Amazon webs and I mean, just eBay and shit is that like once you establish your brand and your platform, it's a pro- progression of growth that like next year, if I established my website, say with all of my products and already dabbled into the marketing aspect, I could pick up that same shit, that same pre-built platform, remarket it next year, maybe when the top when a topic is not dead anymore or overplayed, and pick right back up to that 20 grand, 30 grand a month income revenue. Right. No, like, I, have you, yeah, go for it. Well, I was gonna ask you, have you you've heard of Shopify, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I, I, I talked to you about it. So yeah, before, um, but what I've, uh, so me and my buddy, we're embarking on a new, on a new uh, product idea. Right. Try, trying this out. You know? the, the way I'm, the way I see it, and we'll have to catch back up at a later point in time on this yeah. topic, but um, yeah, the way so I see it. It's live right now, yeah. You know, <laughs> it's live on Instagram. Huh? This is like uh, broadcasting, so yeah, you don't so, um, but yeah, I was planning on doing this, uh, like do it yourself closet lighting. So do it yourself closet lighting. You have to first research the market, did that. But now, and, and I found a niche, it's a niche market. The thing is by using Shopify, you can make a ton of money by branding a niche item, which again, it's not a, it's not a get rich quick scheme. You can get money. You can make Twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars over a month period doing that. So yes, in this sense, it's get rich quick. But you, it's a, you have to build the foundational platform, and once the foundational platform is built, then your money comes and streamlines off the top of your advertising and sales from right. Facebook campaigns, your Google AdWords searches. You can throw it on Etsy, whatever it be. But um, I'm diving into this product that is transforming closets like your everyday average apartment closet that you move in shit it looks like shit i can't see anything i have no lighting i don't want to install a light i want <clears throat> I, I need to worry about the paint and everything after i move etc but just you can buy these products offline and source them from different places end up building up a brand image advertising the living shit out of it that's where you, you take risks on advertising because it's yeah. there's a thousand variables that can be changed and just by changing one variable it can make or break the fucking product oh, if yeah. your font size is too small and maybe maybe people don't like that kind of yellow that you use for your font it yep. should so yep. that, that's the hard dude the but, crazy thing is i was just uh talking about branding the crazy thing is a lot of people don't understand it. Like it's so much psychology, it's so much science, it's so much art. And it's like, 
little bit of each one. And if you go all in with a scientific mind, you're going to fail. Like you're not going to make any money. If you go all in with a psychological mind, then you're not like you're all you are is selling and your product is shit. And if you go in with all of like engineering and branding mind, then you end up with people that think that you're just selling to them without any value. So it's like, so it's like a little bit of each one. And the funny thing is I was just reading a book. It's called positioning. And how do you like, when, when I hear Tesla, Tesla already has electric vehicles positioned inside my head. When I think of Apple, I think of luxury products that like are only 3% of the population that has it, but they're yep. richer than the other guys. And that's positioning. And the funny thing is like, you have to get there first at times, or you have to be much better than the others. But that little yeah. trick, for, little trick for everybody in that book that I like use in my everyday life is that less is more. In, mm-hmm. yes. in the cool. world, in the world of advertising, like you like an average human being consumes over, I think like like over 20 gigabytes of data a day. Yeah. Like in, in 20, that book was written in like 2014 or something. And by now it has probably like doubled at least. Um, yeah. And the funny thing is like, I work with a lot of people and sometimes we have to go train other people. And a lot of people suck as trainers or like suck as engineers because they when they're reporting to somebody else, they're not cutting to the chase. They're like giving them the whole detail and the other person is not getting anything yeah is going above their head yep and that's the same thing with branding like you all about bringing it down to a fourth grade level yeah a three word three four five word banging structure that just resonates with people and as far as in you know what i like to uh i like to look at this company as a model i thought they they did a really good job of it um it's a company called live loci have you heard of their bracelet I have not. So Loci, Live Loci is a, is a company. They first started off by making bracelets, right? They make these silicone bracelets that are all, they're, they're beaded like this. They're not of crystal beads or nothing. But on the top side here is a white bead, which is filled with water from the Himalayas, which is the highest point on earth. Yes. And then down here, is a black bead, which is filled with mud from the Dead Sea with the lowest point on earth. And their slogan behind their whole entire ad campaign is, when you're feeling high, the white, highest, highest mountain on earth with water in it, stay humble. When you're feeling low, the mud from the Dead Sea, which is the lowest point on earth, stay hopeful. And everything in between, which is all of the clear beads, are open for interpretation and open for your own journey kind of Holy thing. So fuck. it's a reminder. See, that's like they made this bracelet. Mo. They made this bracelet. I'm just going off their Instagram. Right? <laughs> if their Instagram their Instagram has 1.8 million followers. Right. If say one person equals one follower which I'm really lowballing this one person equals a follower. That's $18 million just off the bat in revenue without wholesale, without any bulk orders out, any other excess non expenditures. But then that, so they start off with one simple bracelet idea. Then so think about it from a lifestyle standpoint, right? Cause it, why do we do the things that we do? Why are we trying to do entrepreneurship? Because we're we're after money for lifestyle, and not only in that, but we're after the lifestyle of changing the world with our dream. That's why we want to start the business in general. So he or she, whoever started Loki, wanted to see the world a better place and remind everybody to stay humble and stay hopeful on their risk. But now he was able to expand in all sorts of different markets by can by doing like breast cancer awareness, um, giving back to deforestation, all by changing the colors. Of it. Gotta love that and, shit. But, and then by donating that much money, now from a business standpoint, that donation, of course, is all tax write-offable, but from a perspective of, um, of a lifestyle, 
if the person, the CEO, wants to travel the fucking world and that's his goal, he can now do that on the name of his company because he's marketing his brand. And all of the money that he spends traveling and doing that shit is now right offable. And if he makes 75K in one year and spends 50K of it traveling the world, he's not, he's not getting, he's not paying $30,000 in taxes. He's paying, he, he's paying taxes on 20% over his difference cost. No, dude, that's 100%. Like, that is, the best like example for branding and because the crazy thing is like let's say we're investors and these guys from Lokai say yeah we are gonna make bracelets the first question as an investor you ask is like how are you any different from the 3,000 other brands that are out there well that's when these guys yep. are like well we fucking got like the Dead Sea dirt and then we got like Himalayas water in here yep. and it's like, all right so this appeals to a very small niche like I would think like this like the thing about niche and a lot of people don't get it because I think like as humans, we always like, even in 20th century, it was always like make a product that you can sell to a lot, a lot of people. And now in 21st century with the information overload, with everything overload, you have to remember that if you are talking to everybody, you're talking to nobody. And it's just like, that's like the hardest thing for like a startup or even like a sole entrepreneur to realize. Like if I'm a, if I'm a personal trainer to every single age group, every single population, then I'm a personal trainer to nobody, right? Like I'm not personal to anybody. So then like the funny thing is it sounds easy, but it's so fucking hard. Cause like, it is. like right now my ideal client, let's, let's take the example of my personal training. So my ideal client, isn't reaching out to me, right? Like I already have those lined up. The people that are reaching yeah. out to me are not my ideal clients. And I know talking to them only distracts me from working with my ideal client. And mm. it's like, the funny thing is like a lot of these generalizations that we make, the single liners, the one liners, they, they, they don't account all the nuances. <laughs> and when you actually like get in the dirt, when you actually start working, you realize that mm shit is hard but that's where you learn and that's the beauty of it like i think a lot of people get scared when they reach that and it should be the opposite like who gives a fuck keep trying <laughs> like yep yep and this how Ga- that's how that's how gary v always puts it man big yeah. inspiration you better yeah. fucking close your eyes until you're 29 <laughs> years old <laughs> for the rest of those fucking years man Dude, I'm gonna see him in a, I'm actually seeing right, Gary right, in a right month. Now. I'm excited to see him in a month. Um, he's gonna Where? be in New York City. Um, wow. There's like awesome. a big conference that, um, and that's also fucking ballsy. Like, I'm making student loan payments, and then these things. So here, like, let's talk about some other nuances, right? So student loan yep. payments. Student loan payments are a must, and I got those locked up, and everything was looking good, and. Then like all these other opportunities arise. Like I'm building a brand and do I go hang out with the people that already built the brand and I like learn from them or do I fucking save the money and sit in my, like in my home here in fucking Peoria, Illinois that nobody knows of. Right. So like, it's like choices, choices, choices. And the whole day you're making, you're making decisions. And one is like, yeah, and at the end of the day, it's it's what what is fucking right and what's the right move? Is it? And I don't think there is an answer, honestly. I think the only move, the only right move, is by doing, um, by by taking executable steps. But of course, you're you're split with like circumstances like this, a rock in a hard place. I gotta save money for my student loans and pay for my bills and have a surplus, or I guess I have to each for this month, maybe some ramen noodles or whatever, cut back on X amount and then take a step. But I think more than more times than not, bro, I think um, those trips to meeting new people and new connections are always 10 Xers on your return. Major ROI. 
Because, right. you know, you never – and, and there's no way to quantize any of that because you, you're going to meet people and those people are going to say things to you that are going to influence your drive and your thoughts in different ways and make you look at new angles that you may never have looked to if, unless you had gone to there. Um, and you never know, man. Like everything in my life to this point, I'm here in California now – Every single step to this point has been, it's been given to me by another individual, yep. but it wasn't, a, I took the steps to go out there and seek the vulnerability in order to have that in my life. It, it, that's, that's all there is. Like I was denied in a Kettering three times before I got in. So oh, I man. took my eight, three fucking times. And I, you want to know how many acceptance letters I wrote to them? And because I knew, I knew that that place was where I wanted to go for the co-op program, but it was a consistency that paid off. Same thing with school, same thing with anything out here. It's not the smart people in life that get by, that fucking make it. It's not the smart people out. You don't need to be smart. You don't need to be blessed. You don't need to have any sort of fucking cards dealt to your hand. Of course, it's easier when that is happening, or it's even harder because you're faced with different spoils that those sort of people are faced. So there's no good or bad. They don't, they're only just is do. And it, you have the Dude, same it, fucking, fucking crazy. Hours. Let's talk about hours. something that, that, let's talk about something that hits home for both of us. Cause it, it's like literally that. And that is like, as engineers or like people that come out of like great engineering schools where we come from, yep. we like, like are right, here, this, hear me out on this one. Right? Like, I know people who are making like more money in a month selling fitness plans that I am maybe I'm way more qualified to sell, but I'm fucking comfortable because I have a job and they don't have a job. So like all day, they like these people come from like working at Starbucks and McDonald's, which I did in high school. But, like these people work from there and then they leave those jobs and then they go balls deep, work, like making sales, like selling what they already do and they're making so much more than what I make. But the crazy thing is I like try to spend, so I get out of work around four ish, you know, like an average nine to four job. And then I love my job. Like that's one thing I really like my job right now, but I get up and then I spend the next five or six hours working on my, you know, brand and all that. And the crazy thing is at the end of the day, I'm hungry as fuck, but I'm still not as hungry as the other guy. And like, Cause I have like a, st a steady state of income coming through. Like the safety net. The safety that, net. that shit annoys me. Like, that shit annoys me. Like as engineers or as like professionals, we are like more qualified to do these things. But like, it's, it all comes down to like that drive. Like yep. I get rejected from a sale. Let's say like I, I can't close a sale. I might be like, you know what? Fuck it. I have to get up for work tomorrow morning at 7am. So let me just go to bed for them. It's like, no, I have to make the fucking payment. Yeah. yeah. And, it's, and it's just yeah. like, these are the things I've learned in the last one month. And it's so wild. <laughs> like, it, is rough. it sounds like we always talked about like being comfortable, being comfortable and all that. But it's like, I feel like a kid in Detroit, a homeless kid in Detroit can has more potential to be successful than a kid living in a mansion in California because the kid in Detroit comes from nothing. And that's like a weird feeling. That's like, yeah. you know, like that's very different. And I've never, you know, I, and, and I can't talk about that cause I didn't come from nothing. I wasn't rich and I, right. parents, I I'm still paying for my whole college education, yeah. but you know what? Um, in just looking back in hindsight to a lot of our Kettering, uh, a lot of the just alumni who I went to college with. And whenever I shared stories and just found out about how they're paying for college while their dad was paying for it, or parents put up a trust fund for them early on, those same people didn't have the same drive in school. And those same people, because daddy's paying for it, because the fucking money is already put up there. So if they skip a class, which costs them $400 to go on Monday, they don't yeah. give a fuck. Yeah, but yeah. if I do, 
if I do and I and I can realize, oh, that four hundred dollars is really going to cost me five hundred and fifty dollars, and I'm literally tossing that out. It, it's a lot more. It's a different perspective. And you know, it's interesting that you said that about um, just the opportunity. I have a friend. I'm not going to say his name, but I have a friend that uh, he lives back in my hometown, and he didn't end up going to college. Well, he went out. He ended up going to college for a little bit, doesn't have student loans, and um, he didn't really find his way, didn't really find a, a niche or a passion that drives him. Right. Um, and he's an only child, and he's living at his house at the moment, you know, still in the same bedroom, and he's, he's depressed. He's very upset. And I told him, I'm going to call him Jeff for sake of this. Call him Johnny. Like, hey, Johnny. Johnny. All right. I was like, hey, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I would give my left nut to have what you have right now. And he's like, what, what, what do you mean, man? I was like, listen, you have a blank slate, meaning that you can eat, sleep, breathe, and shit right now because you're living in a parent's household for free. For me to be here, in, Mo, for me to be here in California just to breathe and sit here and talk to you right now cost me 38 hundred dollars just to fucking breathe yeah. and that, that that's that's without my food payments dog or or my gas yeah, yeah. so like cost of expense is real out here and I, you know i have to say that kind of goes down to it's one of those that you either use it as a catalyst man or or let it defeat you but like just being out here i made sixty five thousand at my last job and it wasn't enough it wasn't uh, like I was, I'm so let out like $13,000 in credit card debt for two years because of it. Right. But I stuck, I stuck through it because I knew that if I did that, it was an investment towards the future. But it's that drive because if I didn't have this $140,000 student loan debt, I wouldn't be in such a fucking rush or I wouldn't have a chip on my shoulder to try to save the education system. The whole entire reason why I'm in mechanical engineering at the moment, product design, entrepreneurship, et cetera, is because I want to master these A and C and so I can create the life of, that I want and I want to give back to the younger roots and I want to fuck up their, the education system that's in place, man. Like that shit, they, don't, they, they teach you how to be a worker not to work for yourself. They teach you how to live somebody else's dream, not to live your own fucking dream. What kind of world is that, dog? Like you get so excited, you go through you go through high school, bam, then you're on to college. You go through college thinking, bro, I thought I was going to be a fucking wit of a scientific mechanical sorcerer coming out of college. But the teachers don't have time to teach you that. You don't have time to study that. Your friends don't have time to help you do that. So what the fuck are you paying 150K to go do? Live some, to work for somebody else's dream. But that's, of course, if you don't get an internship or you don't take steps for an internship, good luck at Nautica till you're 25, bro. That's just how it is. It's fucking unfortunate. Dude, I, I totally friends agree. coming out of Michigan State or U of M in engineering who can't get jobs. Yeah. Unless you have an internship program, but how many schools are cost efficient, meaning I could get my education for under 50 grand for my education. Bro, you know like, what's so fucked up? Let me tell you something that's really fucked up. And that annoys the flying monkeys out of me. And that is nobody talks about college education. Like, in the world of politics, in the world of everyday protests, like our, our fucking population cares more about football players taking knees or like fucking like waking up. Like I have, so right now I live in a pretty conservative town. Nothing wrong with that. But my point is almost every day at around like when I get out of the gym at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., there are people protesting outside of women's health center because they don't believe in abortion. But Nobody, and I mean nobody, gets up and says, are you fucking kidding me? We are touching $1 trillion in college loan debts. And these are the people that are like the smart, the knowledge of our society. And we're literally penalizing people for getting educated. Like, 
how fucked up is that? Like, how fucked up is that? <laughs> but then again, like, you know, like, it's the same, at the same time, I'm really trying to think, like, because I've been asking this question myself. Would I have this chip on my shoulder, this fucking fire in my heart, this catalyst or crucible that I'm trying to be, that my life is being forged into if I didn't have that student loan debt? You know, it's a, it, 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 I yeah. guess you could bring these same morals and lessons back down to like the ideas of basic income, right? Yeah. Like if you give the population like free fucking whatever, and you know, I'm not, I'm not even saying give education away for free. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm, you know, it's just, it's, it's not right the way it is. The fact that my fucking roommate can, because he doesn't come from, because he doesn't, okay, he did because he, he doesn't come from anything and neither does half of the people, but yet that he can still go to college for fucking free and then piss it away and get a second chance at it for free. And then ultimately go back and finish your degree unscathed while the rest of everyone else is like picking up, like barely getting by or just even the fact that somebody won't ever make it because their parents aren't blowing 150 K or doesn't want to sign for a loan for them. Big one. Yeah. That's another big one. Um, that, that's it. That's a whole thing, bro. Like, and think about it. Like now we're facing a very interesting time to where you can now come here to San Francisco Bay. You can drive Uber or Lyft, something that anybody can do as long as you have a decent car. And you can make $1,500 a week, which is more than my engineering salary out here, driving a fucking car. Now, yeah. you tell me, what's the incentive for these younger kids now to go to college? They're going to be like, I can make 1500 bucks driving my own schedule, not having with my finger to the world outside my window, not having to pay back student debt. Dude, we should do okay, We should do another like, podcast. Yeah. We should do another podcast and the title should be is college worth it. Um, and like, I think like both of us are like in perfect positions to critique that because we both already graduated. <laughs> it's like we both went through the process and now we're in the real world. And now it's time to like realize whether it was worth it or not. We'll talk about that. New York Times bestseller, bro. Huh? Like, 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 like for real, that could be a legit, I really, really contemplated releasing a book. And it, like just putting my whole mini biography up to it. And of course, I hate the books that don't propose a fucking solution. So yeah. it'll build you up to it and leave you in the air. So yeah. there needs to be a solution. But right now, the solutions, because it, it, and this is what I was saying that I want to get back to as my roots after I go off and fulfill my other dreams, which is becoming financially free for my own life so I can be I, I, I'll tell you right off the bat man I don't want a big house I don't want a fancy car I have a little Honda Velocity I'm totally chill with it Same. and I, I'll drive that till the day I fucking die I just want to see I want to see education for the younger involve how to make money and teach people things like E-commerce platforms like Shopify, drop shipping, marketing, Facebook ads, search engine optimization, fucking <laughs> all of the runs of selling a product through from customer service to you're down X amount of product. Now you need to fulfill orders. Now you need a trimming. And how, to do, how to do personal orders. branding? How to do personal branding? Like, yeah. see the funny thing is, everything. Dude, the crazy thing is I so, so agree with you on everything you say. And the crazy thing is, bro, like when I graduated college, I had two options. I, uh, I was accepted into a master's program and I could have gone into that or I could have looked for a job. And the mm -hmm. hardest thing at that time was looking for a job, especially the job that I would like. Because going to school again, going to a graduate school just seemed so autonomous. It seemed like, like... I think like if for me at the time, it felt like I didn't have to figure out what I wanted to do. So I was like prolonging that process by going to extra school years. 
So like school, school, school. So then I never had to face the hard questions. And then the crazy part is like, there's so many things that you never even know exist. And that's why like, like going to this conference in New York city and seeing Gary V and all these people, like these conferences cost money and there's definitely an investment you have to make. But dude, I always justify it that I fucking paid four grand for a bullshit class in college just because somebody said it was a requirement for my major. Sure. And like, and it's just like learning, like I, I can't justify like the things that I learned in college, they were theory and they were all of that, but where's the fucking use? Like, I feel like I'm that little, little girl in eighth grade who's complaining about Pythagorean theorem. Like, uh, like, like what's the use to that? If I can make money, like, because making money, bro, I, I've learned this after trying a lot of hard things in life. Making money is the hardest thing to do. If you learn how to make money, you're fucking good. Yep. Like, nobody, teaches, all the manners. nobody teaches you, you how to make money. money. <laughs> yeah, that's right like the only thing that really fucking matters in this world is how do you how do you have clean water how do you have healthy food and how do you make money all three are very esoteric answers that have yeah. no root in our common education yeah. and, and it's like it's so wild it's so wild to like think that because i know people who are like See, like, I think a lot of scientists, like, in our field think, like, if they can build the, you know, the next, like, freaking fish pond that's, like, super environmentally friendly, they will make money automatically. Or a lot of scientists think if they cure cancer, like, fuck that phrase, if they cure some form of cancer, they'll be rich. Or, like, but, like, it never happens. Like, getting rich or making money is very different from, like, doing something that like it's kind of like it's kind of like getting noticed like me yeah. and you me and you could have this conversation via phone and not have anybody but i was just facebook living it and 194 people have watched it in the last 10 minutes and oh. on my on my instagram other people are watching it on my other instagram more people are watching it and that's like that's when it comes down to getting noticed and nobody teaches you how to get noticed. Like, right. nobody teaches you how to right. do that. And, Engage. like, I was talking to, um, you, you remember Professor Tawakoli from college? Mm-hmm. From CAS? Mm-hmm. I was talking to him about it, and I was talking to him about personal branding, because me and him, we, we talk like that. It's so cool. Like, and he was like, what we were talking, it was something like, like, you can have the best skills in the world. And when you, oh yeah, we were talking about job applications or like applying for jobs. And I like right now, I've gotten to interview some people along the way for jobs. And the funny thing is, everybody tells you to, you know, wear a nice suit. Everybody tells you to have a nice resume. Everybody tells you to fucking like be like shake hands firmly or like, you know, like get there 15 minutes early. Nobody, and I mean, nobody tells you to be an interesting person. And I remember every single person we like would hire was an interesting person. Like there was something more to that person and nobody teaches anybody to be an interesting yeah. person. Like, like you do a lot of interesting. Yeah, right. And you know, I wonder, um, cause I obviously, I just went through all of that range. I was doing interviews left and right over here in the Bay. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you, well, I actually felt so weird walking into these startup companies with a suit that I went out and I bought a blazer to dress down. Yep. So like I was walking in, like <laughs> here, here I am, all ketteringed out in kettering suit, got my shirt, my tie, all sorts of shit. I'm walking in, no everyone wears jeans, shorts, hoodies on the on the day, uh, daily. So they're looking at me, they're like, who who the fuck brought this stiff in? Dude, hundred percent. And so, like, over here, man, it, over here, I felt extremely weird, especially wearing a suit. So, like I said, I went out and I bought a blazer. Um, but yeah, touching no based on the personal branding is that everyone, you know, and, like, through the interview process, what really drug out for me was that 
I showed up to each interview, right? Here I am. Here's my resume. Here's my resume. Just pretend it is. Yeah. Um, here's my resume. And so like, I'll lay it down and I'm like laying it down for person at first just to be accepted into their fucking f- group. Just that, like, like, I have to, like, prove myself with my 2D piece of paper. I can be accepted. I could be one of you guys. I swear I can. Like, it, it, everyone else is bad, but, but uh, I'm good. But they don't teach you how to sit. It almost, like, you, you end up showing up at a job kind of, like, sorry to be there. Like, almost, almost, sit, almost like you woke up like an accident. Like, you're handing them there, but you don't show up like, like, this is why you fucking need me on this shit. You know, not that egotistical, of course, but what I'm getting at is that we weren't taught on how to brand yourself as you show up. This is why you need to hire me, and this is the importance that I'm going to have to your organization. Now, yeah. I'm, I can make money with you guys. I can make money with that company down the road. It doesn't matter. I like your guys' applications. I feel that my 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 skill sets fit nicely within your organization and and set. But it's not, yeah. It's especially Dude, I, on the East Coast. Yeah. It wasn't like hundred um, percent. Like, I um, I <laughs> let me Snapchat this story because this is funny. I was um, uh, I was once interviewed for a software engineering position at a Fortune 500 company, and I got there with a, wearing a fucking suit. And you I said you did, like, did it? I did, I did, and it was like the biggest mistake ever because everybody else was just wearing like a normal software engineer, like fucking t-shirt and hoodies. And yeah. Um, yeah. And then, and then it kind of goes, it, yeah, <laughs> it, 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 they don't teach you how to be yourself dog. So for all of you listeners listening and job market, or whatever, you hey, gotta hey, be yourself. Hey, just, hold on one second. Let me, um, let's get on. Go for it. What message do you have? For, what message do you have for people? Oh, okay. Um, my message for everybody here, for whoever's listening, if you're on the job market, you're just graduating college, trying to get a job, et cetera, don't follow the lines of you have to wear a suit, you have to have your resume all doctored up. You pretty much can have, you're in the business of selling yourself. You need to walk in there and own yourself being, especially if you don't have the actual physical skills you have your own emotional skills, your emotional attributes to apply for. If you can't apply for your, with the skill sets you have, you have to apply with your personality to give it all that you got Fuck and yeah. make yourself stand out just by your personality. Dude, hundred percent. Like, dude, fuck yes. Like once you got the interview, then it comes down to that. Like, yeah, you have to have some skills and all that, but Dude, it was so crazy. So yeah, like that's why like oh. st- studying engineering is good because it sets you up for like a b- variety of things. And then it does. If you study Shakespeare studies in college or you study 12th century literature, you're fucked. Yep. Like, sorry, right, you're fucked. Yeah, yeah. If, if that's what you have to tell to the world is to bring light Shakespeare's, but you know, by all means. You could very well do that, and through motivation and your own personal branding, maybe that's your niche on how you want to touch the world. Then you could fucking make that a multi bajillion dollar business for yourself, traveling the world, Shakespearing everything, going to little click poetry and shit like that. But ultimately, you know, just as an icon engineer, man, if you know how to make shapes nowadays with 3D printers, three, four hundred dollars, you can make. Like, for instance, here, I'll, I have a little prototype I got in my hand. I've made a while back, um, yeah. but I use this with a 3D printer. But this is something that I just want to make and see in the world. So uh-huh. I wear this bird every day, right? This is just uh-huh. black yes. energy, bead, hollow light, <clears throat> et cetera. But I, I, and I like the size and dial of this bracelet, but I wanted to convert it into something more functional. Yep. This isn't – this is just a, a one of many prototypes, but – I'm always faced with challenges where I need flashlights, whether I'm wrenching under my car, I'm collecting firewood, I'm pitching a tent, um, I'm in my bed and I'm, my, tr- my phone charging and I need to get up and grab a drink of water, whatever. 
whatever point in time to where you need light that's on a simple click of a button because your phone takes too goddamn long to try to get out that flashlight, you just reach over and then click, and then it's a wrist light, like a flashlight. But if I can make that. That's actually a really, it's really good. Thanks, bro. Appreciate yeah. it. But yeah, if I can transform this into this, but again, like it's almost a matter of plugging and playing. We have Google on our hands, man. I built a whole entire new modular human to vehicle interface using Google as my search engine, just fucking Googling shit. Yeah. You can do anything, man. It only takes just education. Just got to try it out. And like, when you fail, just use that as a fuel to keep going. Like, that's one thing. Like, that's why like passion, like passion is a, is a phrase that's like commonly misthrown around. But I think like that's where like your interest in something comes in. And yes, the, the, yeah. universe, the universe really rewards people who take action. Like people who just do it, do it, do it, do it. Don't think too much. Like Gary Vee always says like you're either being patient or you're taking action. Don't be the one fucker who's always like, I'm still thinking. That's not being patient. That's like you being scared. That's like you being doubtful. Yeah. Like, yep. either like you are like, I'm being patient. I know this podcast is just taking off and I'm not expecting 1 million views. Like that's being patient. Right. Yep. But on the other hand, like if I just, I have friends, bro, let me tell you, I have friends who have like crazy good and, and like analysis on certain situations. And I'm like, bro, make a video, like fucking make a video and put it out there. And you know, the, it got me, it got me really angry. He said, I'm Mr. Nobody. Nobody will ever watch it. And he didn't do it. I was like, all right, fuck you. Like, you know, like if you think like that, if like Albert Einstein thought that way, when he was working at a patent office, <laughs> like relativity would have never happened. If yeah, like if Pablo Picasso felt that way, like there was so much like, I don't know. There's so many people in our generation that are doubtful. They, they oh, like, absolutely. That are just always think like, that's why like me being here, like I feel I'm a very friendly person. So like I can make friends and that's usually not a problem, but here in Illinois, I'm being extra cautious about making friends. Like if you make friends with losers per se, you're, you're, it's only going to be a distraction. You got to make friends with people that are above you. People yeah. that lift you up, like people that inspire you to become a better person because everything else is a distraction. I, I think a lot of people just hang out with distractions. And it's just like, if, if you want to be somebody better than where you are at the moment, there are two things that can elevate that level. One is you read kick-ass books every day. Like you're putting in the work. And second, you're hanging out with people who are better than you. And it's literally like, like this book, I... Uh, like Think and Grow Rich, very famous book, 20th century, 1936. Like this guy went around and interviewed like, I think like, what was it, like 50 millionaires at the time, multimillionaire in 1930s. And he spent 10 years on this book. And like he like picked their brains on what, like what drove these people, what made them successful. Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, um, Tesla. I mean, just so many, so many people. And Andrew Carnegie, uh, Dale Carnegie, all those guys. And he talks about that. He has a whole chapter on like hanging out with people that are better than you. Like he, he was talking about how Henry Ford, the guy who made General Motor, I mean Ford uh, Motor Company, how his success doubled after he started hanging out with Thomas Edison. And like this shit is like hanging out with people that are better than you. In school, yep. in school, we're told that, you know, like old is gold and, you know, all those friendships are really good. They are good. But if you want to become better version than you are right now, there are only one or two things that you can do. One, read books. And second, hang out with people that are better than you. In my opinion, that's like the only two things. Like you, like you being in Silicon Valley, bro, like it puts you in a different mindset then somebody who's working in like freaking Dayton, Indiana. And like, it's very different. Because <laughs> yeah. cause you can, because it's a community that you have access to, even though I might not hang out with them, but it's just the mindset. Like 
it's almost down to a fault almost i'll tell you just because over here i'm never relaxed and it because i'm always just worried about grinding it out whether i'm trying to look for a job or getting a job or on my um side flow game just grinding it out on a side project or going eating and networking <clears throat> like there's unlimited things that you can do um <clears throat> but that's why you know keeping your circle small with the right people are the utmost essential parts because because <clears throat> if you if you don't have each other to boost each other up for one um it, it, it's really hard too if you don't have the right if you don't have the right topic to passion out of you because if you're not passionate about it then you, then when it gets tough, then you're just going to give up and you're like, Oh fuck, I don't want to do that anyway. But if it's something that you're like, that, that you're want instead of I want this to happen turns into, I need this to happen. When, when is that want turns into a need? That's how you know that that's the right topic to pursue. And honestly, bro, that's the hardest fucking part of, of it all. And getting there and putting your head down and grinding, that's not the hard part. Getting recognized is not the hard part. It's starting. It's taking the initial step to start. And it's even just, I mean, because there's a million and one fucking topics and that a particular person could be interested in. So everyone's like, huh, where do I fucking, where do I go? I don't, I don't know. Like I'm so, I'm paralyzed whenever I think about this problem. And what I come to help me do is um i listened to one of the podcasts i think this is on like um i think this came from uh like lewis house like on one of his uh school of greatness podcast was one of the quotes that somebody said was that you need to do on oh, no, i'm so sorry i'm blanking on this oh you're good you're good think about it i'll come back to that um that's right. You, you, you list out your curiosities, what you're curious about in life, and list them out in a Venn diagram. Like, I'm right. curious about, I don't know, health and, health and fitness. I'm curious about um, consciousness and how the mind works. And maybe I'm uh, interested about how uh, nootropic, like, an NOO, nootropic drugs affect your brain and fitness and consciousness. Right. And, and so now these are all topics to branch together to become more curious about an overarching topic that you're already curious about. Cause that's where, that's where the key a difference in our, in everybody lies is, is that each one of us has our own specific niches that we want to tackle and help the world have, but we just don't know which parts of our Venn diagrams that we need to couple together. But as soon as we have the idea, Dude, I, it's really just bro, like, down funny, thing is, funny thing is I like, I love being vulnerable. <laughs> I don't know why, but right now I'm going through that phase because the last three months I spent developing my software engineering skills to like mm -hmm. do more software related projects and go out and build websites for small businesses and do that. I'm decent at it. Like I learned a lot and I, I, I can code and all that. But the funny yep. thing is, the funny thing was I was spending two hours at the gym and not getting paid, <laughs> right? Like I would work out because I loved it. Like it was something that I, I would read 15 scientific papers on metabolism just because I wanted to. And, yeah. and then I would force myself to go re go like watch Harvard CS 50 videos to learn about like computing. And the funny thing was the day that I realized that my business actually lies in fitness and not, software development boom boom like it was like a shift yep everything like i became you two passions that you were curious about you were able to flip it and combine them into your own coupled with your own specific attributes of your personality outgoing i can go getter people person etc bro let's let's uh let's bring it back to what we were talking about early when we're in school the whole time we're sitting together with 25 other kids and we're being taught the same way the individuality is taken out of you in school like people make you mm -hmm. like 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 it's, it's, it's crazy because 
dude, I'm str- like, I'm building that right now because I read so much and I'm like developing myself and I take action. I'm not like, if I'm making a decision, I make it quick. Cause I know after those five seconds, I might delay it for five weeks. Um, and so like, my point is like, when I got out of school or when I got out of college, I realized that I was always trying to fix my weaknesses. I never strengthened my strengths. Like I read one of my, uh, actually this is related to college. One of my social science professors, one day we were talking about some bullshit social movement or something. And like he was part of the lecture. And then he goes, he goes, if you love your life, read this one paper written by Peter Drucker. It's called managing oneself. Fuck man. I like managing oneself. Like, How do you become an executive of your own life? And Peter Drucker, fuck, like one of the best economists of 20th century. And dude, I was so happy. I wrote that down in my notebook. So I went home that night and I looked it up. I printed that paper and I read it. And bro, every single page hit home. Because Peter Drucker, on the second page, he talks about, he's like, first of all, determine, are you a reader or are you a listener? And then like he was asking all these questions because he, he was saying that in 21st century, a lot of the companies that people work for are going to die before your career ends, before your career ends. And this guy predicted that like in late 20th century. And he was saying that people are going to have to switch careers. And the only way, the only successful people are going to be the people who build their second career while they're at their first career. And then when it comes time, boom, you go all like, you know, you go balls deep. And, but that, that like paper changed me. Like he made me, he was the first smart person who told me in my fucking face that don't worry about your weaknesses, improve your strengths, like go all in on your strengths. Mm -hmm. And like, that was the first time. It's so crazy. That was the first time it hit me. And then it is, bro, you're a hundred percent right. 100% 100% like, right now. People always tell you to improve your weaknesses. You should, but not at a point where you're taking away from your strength. Like my weakness is probably software engineering. Like I, I, I enjoy it, but not to the point where I enjoy the fitness industry. Like fitness comes so natural to me, like coaching people, inspiring people, um, like making, like having, just changing people's life, giving them confidence. That comes a lot natural to me. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my friends, they can't speak on camera. Like they, I love doing photo shoots. I like, I love being the face of the camera. My friends can't do that. Mm-hmm. It's just like for the first time in my life, I've come to a point where I realize weaknesses don't feel bad about them. Just fucking go all in on your strengths. And then like Lewis house, I do Lewis house responded to me once. Lewis house responded to my Snapchat once. I Snapchat. Oh, yes. No, he really did. I remember this was two and a half years ago and Lewis house was talking about, being great at one thing. And then once you're great at that thing, then you can be good at many things. And I messaged him back and I was like, bro, I, I'm trying to be good at many things because that's what I'm told. I was a sophomore in college back then. And Lewis house literally replied a one liner. He said, be great at one thing. And then when you're great, then be good at many things. So like when you're starting off a company, be really good at your product, like have a kick-ass product. And once you get there, then, be good at marketing, be good at like talking to other, then be good, be good, be good, be good. But in the beginning, be great at one thing. And it was like in college, it's the opposite. Like in education system, it's the opposite. You have to be good at math. You have to be good at science. You have to be good at freaking sports. You have to be good at English. You have to be good at Shakespeare studies. You have to be good at everything. And that's why people get left out. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Dude, I, I love how you hit that for sure. Gary Vee always talks about um, tripling debt. Don't go half pregnant on 12, triple down on three and fucking deliver. Like you, you got to yeah. take what you're good at. And again, this is very e- This is easier said than done because this is, this is the hardest fucking part, remember, is finding what you're great at, is finding the hard, well, where do you even go? Like for, for instance, Mo, I've been chilling here in my house, like on this week, so start my next job, next Monday by Friday, last Friday, I already knew I had a job. So I'm like, great, a whole fucking week. What do I do for a week? Do I 
do I start dabbling into like microelectronics and different sensors and shit like that? Or do I go back to the tech shop and CNC fidget spinners or do I fucking laser cut custom shit and laser rat stuff just for fun or do random shit? I don't know. Cause there's so much shit. But I can tell you what I'm not good at is that I'm not good at programming. I'm not good at electronics because yeah. that's not my forte. I'm good at mechanical design and some things in my head. And I'm good at just going out in the world and just networking with the other people and et cetera, blah, blah, blah. But, but like, no. you know, it's the same thing. My, my, don't, biggest, my biggest goal in life right now is literally what you just said. And that is to convince a seventh grader or a sixth grader or a fifth grader or a little kid that dude, don't worry if you suck at fucking math, like just keep working on it. Don't, don't ignore it. Like learn it, but, oh yeah, but please feel that you are important and you are a kick-ass salesman. You are a kick-ass. Oh, yeah. Like, like again, to go back to Gary V, he was a DNF like he's done. He, he found his niche after the wine business. Now he is running a multi million dollar new age marketing titan that will take over all of the others. Yeah, he's after the legacy because he's after he's obsessed with the grind day in and day out. Hey, Ryan, just turn yeah. off your video because the connection is spotty right now. Um, right. but let's continue the audio. Um, and yeah, dude, I totally agree on that. Like, and it's just so crazy how I never like used to think that way. I was always being half pregnant on many things because it felt like the right thing to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. But also, but you know, I feel like at a young age too, you're, you're still trying to figure out yourself, right? You're still trying to figure out what do I have to offer to the world? What's, what's interesting to me that I'm good at. And that's, that's what I think that a lot of people become half pregnant on a lot of stuff because they simply don't know, but that's not their fault. It's, I blame it on our education system because our education system doesn't teach you how to fucking fit, how, how to, how, how to, they don't teach you how to be an accountant when what being an engineer is really like, or being an entrepreneur and why you're even doing this whole entire fucking rat race in the beginning like it because if it's money that you're after that a person is after they will be let down so goddamn fast once they reach that fucking million dollar goal then two million and then three million and then it's going to be on and on and on and on but guess what your time doesn't come back you're still putting in 60 70 hours a week to make x amount of million but you're caught up in a in a vicious loop that won't let you quit so where does that end up leaving that person? Is it? Is it? It's really all what comes down to what's important for one's life. Yeah. And no, dude, that's like that's like the last point of this podcast that I want to make, and that is like, like, yeah, it takes time to figure out what you're good at. So try many things. Find out. Like, there are some things that we know that are just so natural to us. Like. If you are naturally inclined to learn about something, if you're curious about something, even without trying, go follow mm -hmm. that. Like go, go find a way to make money on that. And that's it. Yeah. Like, and that's it. And to uh, the, the hard part is like to make money in that, you're going to have to learn a few other things. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be things that you don't like, but mm -hmm. do it because just keep the bigger picture in mind. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you, you got you to gotta love that thing that you don't like. You got to love it so much that you eat, sleep, and shit that thing that you don't like so it now can become a thing that is easy and that can just be second nature to what you're doing. Like, for instance, you know, starting a, uh, a new business, a new e-commerce business, I don't want to sit here and fucking look up how to do e-commerce, Shopify, dropship, how to run a Facebook ad, et cetera, how to make the actual money. I don't fucking want to sit here and learn it. But if, if, if I get really fucking good at marketing on Facebook and how to build a website, e-commerce web, website through Shopify, et cetera, I should theoretically at the end of that, as long as I'm good enough, be able to take any given product in the fucking world and sell it, even if it's iced 
Eskimos because I still have their Facebook profiles. Right. And they have a sale at 7-Eleven on <laughs> Ice Cube. Yeah, dude. No, I, I hear you on that. And I think, oh, fuck, man. I'm going to have to cut this podcast, but I think yeah. – our users are going to gain a lot of value from this podcast. We touched on a lot of topics and it literally like just comes down to mindset and taking action and learning like the way you were describing graphene and the way like you were talking about uh, big organizations versus small ones and the pros and cons. I think there's a lot of value to be gained in this podcast. So I'm very happy it turned out the way it did. <laughs> and you know, and at the ending, man, what, what my, you know, is college right for the average individual? Here's my answer to that. Um, I think college in hot future education is always right. But when it comes down to paying $150,000, realize what you're, or, or whatever cost, you realize that you're not going to college to learn that stupid fucking information from the textbook that you will obey a command, regurgitate it back in three months, do it for five years and spit it out. You're not even going to remember any of that fucking knowledge. What you are going to remember are the relationships that you've built, the connections that you've made being between the relationships that you've built and the things that you further want to see or do in your life. And that's it, man. College is all about figuring it out and networking with people to figure, figure it out with them. But other than that, at 100%. the end of it, you're you're out of the college education, out of my 150k education. I besides your basic of oh I, I learned how to learn and I learned how to be organized and all of that rah rah bullshit. I just learned how to be a person and how to act in the world, especially by dorming by yourself and being by yourself. It was the greatest teaching experience that I that I could ever have attributed to. The, uh, college literally was the only thing that separates what I'm doing right now and my friend who I went to high school with who works at Kmart. College is literally that thing that separates us. And it's not just the degree or diploma. It's the five years of grind. It's the five years of getting to know people. And I'm getting hungry. Yeah. Getting, getting, oh, 100%. Like, Because this world fucking sucks, dude. There's a lot of room to change it. Like, and, and all of that room should be taken as opportunities. So if you don't know what you fucking want to do, go look at the world and find a problem that bothers you enough that you want to fix and guarantee you, you can start making a monetary income with or without a college education. Most people here in the Valley don't have a fucking college education and they run multi-million to billion dollar conglomerations. So they did that by hustle and hard work and everything falls in. Because in the, it, you're gonna learn in college, you could find on a quick Google search. <laughs> if I want to look up thermodynamics. I can find on fucking Google yep. and have a whole software computer for me. But what I can't, the jobs of the future, man. The jobs of the future are gonna be ones that are actually emotionally trying to save the world and each other. Because anything computer and analytical, bye bye to AI and machine learning. <laughs> Thanks to them. Yep, definitely. Oh, definitely. We should do uh we should do another podcast on AI. I think that would be really cool. Uh, yeah, for sure. I'll love All right, to. Man. I'll go ahead and end this. It's uh, over an hour, but we'll do another one on artificial intelligence and the jobs of future. Cool. Looking forward to it, Mo. All right, you brother. Have a great day. Thanks for having me on, brother. For sure. Take care. All right. Cheers.